George C. Scott in William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist Three. Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Talk. My name is John and today we're here to talk about The Exorcist Three and its brand new 4K Blu-ray that just came out from Scream Factory. But before we dive into that, if you are a fan of 4K Blu-ray reviews, movie reviews, some tech and game reviews along the way, then this is the channel for you and nothing would help this channel out more than by you liking this video and subscribing to the channel. So William Peters Blatty's Exorcist 3 came out on August 17th, 1990 and it's written and directed by William Peter Blatty, who was also the person who wrote the original Exorcist book and wrote the screenplay for the 1973 film, which is one of the most famous horror films of all time. That movie was hyped up to me from a young child as the scariest movie you'll ever see. My mom told me that and when I checked it out, I was definitely too young for it. I was like 12 years old. And I remember thinking, this movie ain't that scary. You know, it wasn't, I thought it was slow and boring. I was 12 years old. It wasn't until I became an adult and I watched it again. And I thought, wow, this movie is a masterpiece. The sense of dread, the, the, just how scary it is and the feeling that you feel throughout that entire film. It only works, I think, if you're an older person who understands, you know, what they're trying to go for. And, and I think that they nailed that. Now, The Exorcist 2 is one of the worst movies I have ever seen in my life. Now, that movie does the one cardinal sin of film that I really don't think anyone should do. It was boring. It's one of the, it, if you want to go to sleep, you put The Exorcist 2 on, I'll knock you out within seven minutes, no problem. Forget Cow and Sheep, watch The Exorcist 2, and I promise you, you'll be asleep. That movie, William Freakin and William Peter Blatty had no part of that. They had nothing to do with it. They didn't write, they didn't direct. It was just, you know what? Everybody who helped make the first Exorcist great wasn't there. A lot of the characters from the first film are there. We don't bring back the team that helped make that movie what it was. And that wasn't until, you know, 1983, William Peter Blatty wrote Legion, which was supposed to become the next Exorcist film, which was gonna be directed by William Freakin called The Exorcist Legion. It fell into development hell, and it wasn't until 1990, after William Freakin had already pulled out, that William Peter Blatty decided to direct this film himself and put George C. Scott in the starring role and it kind of rewrites a little bit of what happened in the original Exorcist. First of all, the original Exorcist took place in 1973, but in this film it changes it to 1975 because they talk about Father Karras from the first film. Actually, he comes back in this film, plays a really major part, but there really aren't too, too many connections between the third film and the first film. You know, this movie, yeah, it's really piggybacking off of what happened in the first film, but we don't ever bring up the demon of Pazuzu. I mean, we assume Assume that that's who is kind of working with the Gemini killer who is played in this film by both Jason Miller and Brad Dourif. Technically, Brad Dourif is the Gemini killer. He Incidentally, was did you know that you are talking to an artist? He was killed by electric chair. I think they said also 15 years earlier. And this movie is really just telling the story of Unfortunately, it looks like the Gemini killings are happening again, and we know that's not possible because the Gemini killer is dead. So George C. Scott is a little confused by all this, and George C. Scott in this film, George C. Scott is an amazing actor. This guy is one best actor for Patton, uh, although he did decline that award. And I always just think of him in one of my personal favorite performances from him as this just bumbling general from Dr. Strangelove. I think he steals the show. I know everyone's gonna point to Peter Sellers, but George C. Scott is amazing in Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, I mean, and in this you see everything. You, you, you see the big boards. Love. And in this one, you know, he's an older man. He would pass away nine years later. He's like 60 years old in this film. And actually, that's one of my biggest flaws is, you know, they talk about his mother-in-law being in here to visit. And I'm thinking, is his mother-in-law 105 years old? Uh, you know, she's cooking fish, letting fish, like, just stay in their bathtub. Because I'm like, George C. Scott ain't young. So I think that they were... You know, originally I think the actor was supposed to be betrayed by like somebody in their like late 40s, early 50s, because it's only 15 years after the original, where it really feels like it's like 40 years. Everybody in here just feels, you know, like a little bit too old compared to like everybody underneath them, except for Brad Dourif. Brad Dourif steals the show in this film. He is incredible. Brad Dourif, I've always felt like, is one of the most underrated actors of all time. I mean, this guy got his shot and one flew over the cuckoo's nest and got an Academy Award nomination for that. And then I feel like people just kind of wrote him off as, you know, the Chucky actor. But really, he's done so much. Look at, watch Mississippi Burning, watch this film. You know, he's a phenomenal actor, very underrated, and takes acting very seriously. There's an interview on this 4K disc that I really think you guys should check out. Just get a mindset of what Brad Dourif does as an actor. He takes it very seriously. He puts all his effort Effort into it. You know, this isn't like, you know, what somebody I feel like would think of Brad Dourif as just like this guy who takes lowbrow horror film roles. No. 
Brad Dourif is a phenomenal actor, and just watch the monologue he does in this film, and I promise you, you'll feel the same way as me if you haven't checked out The Exorcist 3. And what this movie also has is just a real sense of dread. Now, it feels like 1990, where I feel like The Exorcist felt very, very much like the 70s. This feels like 1990, just watching all the cars drive around Georgetown, and just the clothes that everybody's wearing. I just remember, like, you know, the way people had their hair in or 1990 and glasses. Like, you know, you can watch this and watch Ghost, and it feels very similar as far as tone goes, you know, in the sense like, you know, how films were in 1990. And I feel like you could feel that just watching this film, just the set design. It, it all works perfectly in this film. You know, this film isn't perfect because William Peter Blatty unfortunately had his film a lot of studio interference. They really wanted an exorcism. So if you're watching the third act of this film and you feel like that exorcism that happens in the jail, in the uh, mental hospital comes out of nowhere, that's because it does. That he was forced to put that in here. There is a director's cut and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but he was forced to put that in there. And when I was watching it again last night, because I was paying attention to this a little more than I have in the past you know I was trying to watch it with a real critical eye and I was like that just you know this character just came out of nowhere he doesn't feel like he's a part of the rest of the film that we're watching and it turns out yeah that's exactly what happened they forced that in there and against everybody's wishes including Brad Dourif's who said that the ed the original ending was way better but this is what the studio wanted the studio didn't want to present this as the exorcist legacy they wanted to present it as the exorcist 3 and you know it makes sense as a studio hey it's only 15 years after the exorcist which is considered one of the greatest films of all time if we could spin this as the exorcist 3 we'll make a lot more money and it did make a pretty decent amount of money i think it made about four times its budget so as far as the studio goes i'm sure they felt like they made the right decision and i enjoy this movie from beginning to end like i said that kind of that arc with the exorcism at the end really feels like it came out of nowhere but you could tell george c scott brad dura these guys aren't phoning this in i really enjoy the relationship between father dyer and george c scott's character in the beginning of this film like just showing how you know what happened in 1975 in this film not 1973 what happened really had a long-lasting effect on both of them and they both are too proud to admit that it did so they always say like oh on the day it happened you know I like to take Father Dyer to the movies or in his case I want to take you know the cop to the movies because you know it really helps them feel better but really it's there for both of them it's not one or the other they're there to you know an arm to lean on and I really enjoyed that relationship and it actually spoiler alert when it builds up to Father Dyer's death uh, in the hospital, which is insane, by the way, the way that death went down. You know, you really do feel for George C. Scott's character. And especially since he starts to break down in the next scene. So you can see, like, he's just still trying to be this proud man. But it's weighing down on him. And George C. Scott said that what attracted him to the script, it's not a straightforward horror movie. It's a horror drama. And George C. Scott, Brad Dourif, a lot of these actors in this film do a phenomenal job. Also, keep an eye out for a dream sequence where you'll see Samuel Jackson get dubbed. Please. The living are dead. We come here. Samuel Jackson, one of the most famous actors ever. And what's he most famous for? For the way his voice sounds. They dubbed him in this movie, if you can believe that. And it's just such a small little passing role. Hey, you know, hey, I guess you know, we all got to get roles somewhere, get work, and that's what he was doing. But I was just like, damn. And Patrick Ewing is in here. I live in New York. Patrick Ewing is one of the most famous Knicks ever. We never did get a ring with him. He pops up in here as well. But overall, I think The Exorcist 3 is definitely the best of The Exorcist sequels. And as far as films featuring an exorcism, other than The Exorcist, I think The Exorcist 3 is one of the only ones that really kind of stand up to that or even get close and even this one it's not even really in the same ballpark as the exorcist which is considered a masterpiece this is definitely something you could watch every couple of years and get an enjoyment out of it because it's well directed well paced you know i really feel like it's a overall just a good film if you can get past some of the plot holes that unfortunately you can definitely notice if you're paying attention because the studio forced that in here and they had to just kind of edit this together in a certain way to make it work it still works for me i still think it's an overall good film that one that you should check out and if you are going to check this out, perhaps you'll be checking out this new 4K Blu-ray from Scream Factory. So let's check that out right now. Well, here it is. This is The Exorcist 3 on 4K from Screen Factory. Now, this did have a previous 2016 uh, release, I believe. And that release's fingerprints are all over this because the only new thing that is in this scan is this brand new 4K scan of the original camera negative. And that also gets compressed down into the second disc. But this is a three disc set because the first disc features the 4K film, only the 4K film. The second disc features that 4K compressed down to a 1080p Blu-ray with a bunch of extras on there. And then the third disc is that director's cut that came out on that 2016 Blu-ray that actually Scream Factory put out. It was the first time anyone had ever seen that cut of the film. And that's a that's more in line with William Peter Blatty's original vision for the film. But 
We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the disc because there are a couple notes I want to I have on that. But your extras are only going to be on discs two and three. Disc one is just this new 4K scan. The other two discs are definitely more in line with the original release, except on that second disc, you do get the new scan of the film. Where in the third disc, it's that previous scan that came out in 2016. They don't even actually change. It even says the Exorcist 3 disc two on there, even though now it's disc three because you know it's literally just the same disc. So every single thing about this, except for that new 4K scan, is the same from the previous release. And another thing that they didn't change is actually the audio, which is a DTS HD 5.1. There is also a DTS HD 2.0 on here, depending on which way you want to listen to it, but it's also the same exact audio that we had on previous releases of this. So really what you're here for is that new 4K scan with HDR10 on it because there is no Dolby Vision and it's presented as an original aspect ratio of 1.85. So it's going to fill up your entire screen no matter what TV you're using it on. And I thought that this looked pretty damn good. Now I was blown away by it because I actually haven't seen this on physical media before. I've only streamed this film in my entire past or seen it when somebody else is playing it. I've never owned it myself so I can only compare it to this 4k disc or the blu-rays that are in here. I don't have the previous blu-ray release so I was like wow this looks really good. I mean it was pretty damn stunning actually at how good the visuals were and you know there were some scenes early in the film. There's a scene in a confessional that looked very grainy. You could see like the whites kind of popping in on the frames from the actual film scan. And you know, that kind of happens in a lot of dark scenes. And this is where Dolby Vision probably would have helped it because you know, we just get standard HDR 10 here, which is not bad. I think it does a damn good job. But then when I went and compared that 4K to the Blu-ray on the second disc, it was really hard. I was like, wow, this is a damn good Blu-ray. It's a really good Blu-ray. So if this Blu-ray was sold separately, you know, I could say, it, you know what, you can grab that Blu-ray because it's not that much of a difference between the 4K and the Blu-ray. Yes, is the 4K brighter? Absolutely. Are the darks deeper? In certain scenes, it does, elim it does eliminate a little bit of grain, but overall that Blu-ray is one of the better Blu-rays I have seen as a pack-in Blu-ray. And the, you know, comparable to 4K, you really could go either way. I wasn't, and I was blown away by the 4K. I thought it looked great, but but really, it's just a good scan. It's a really, really good scan. And then when I compared it to the third disc, you know, the third disc is tough because it's a new cut. It's a, I believe that one is a, like six minutes less than the original theatrical cut. And this is how William Peter Blatty wanted the film to be. But it, the way that they had to get this made, you know, they had to take some stills, some VHS footage, and you will notice that while you're watching where it'll become a little bit jarring. Like you'll be watching the beautiful HD 1080p Blu-ray and then it'll jump and it'll look like, oh my God, where is that? Like you'll get PTSD like from like a 1994 when you had a VHS in and something popped up and you know, it just started to go, oh my God, wow, that looked bad. So yeah, it, it's a little bit jarring. They do warn you. They put up a little uh, disclaimer before, like they, you know, they did the best they could and you have to appreciate that because we wouldn't have ever got this cut if Screen Factory didn't, you know, edit this together the best they could with the best of the technology. So like we like to talk about here, source material. So what I actually believe in the 4K, some of those darker scenes, especially the confessional, I imagine they used a different camera or a different lens and that's why that scene looks different than every scene that came before is because the source material, you know, that's a real thing. We can only work with what they have and Screen Factory likes to make that known to you. So when you do watch that third cut, this isn't a new cut. This cut is still from that 2016 scan. Nothing changed about that third disc. Like I said, all the extras are the same on there, which is fine. Like I actually, I really did appreciate the extras on disc two and three. There's a blooper reel on two. And again, because of their source material, they actually have a blooper in there with uh, no audio. They only have videos, but it's fun to see guys break. I love watching bloopers because you know, it just shows the power of acting. Like these guys can really get into it. And you know, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. I guess when you break and Brad Dourif, you know, you could see because he was doing with that 20 minute monologue that ah uh, it would just kill him when he fucked up and it would kill me too i get that because i film these videos and a lot of times i fuck up and then i'll restart and it's like yeah it could be a little bit demoralizing i can totally relate to that but those bloopers are fun and then there is a five part it's five different featurettes that are on that third disc again not new but i would have liked them to edit that together into one feature like documentary because each one has an intro and everything like that and i was like yeah we could have done this a little bit different chopped it all together and made one big broad like two hour our documentary and it would have been awesome but we don't get that but the featurettes are all pretty good they're not like short little three minute clips now they're actually a pretty decent length for each for each and the one that stood out to me was brad durris interview because i just appreciate the guy but man 
definitely check those all out. There's plenty of extras in here. Trailers, TV spots, the whole shebang. If you're a fan of The Exorcist 3, you're gonna be really happy with this. The audio, like I said, it's the same from the previous release. It's pretty, you know, it's standard. Uh, it didn't give my rears a workout like I was expecting, but you know, this has one of the most famous jump scares in film history in it. And you know, it's funny because they linger on that shot because you just know it's coming if you haven't seen this film before. And I'm like, wow, they really stay on this shot for a long time. And I feel my heart racing. I'm like, I know it's coming and it still got me. And that's because, you know, the audio jumps and they did a good job in scenes like that with their jump scares. You know, the dialogue was crisp and clear. I didn't have to, you know, pick up my remote at all and adjust it. The dialogue track was mixed very well together with, you know, the background noises, the score when it needed to hit. You know, I thought it did a pretty damn good job. I would have loved a Dolby Atmos track, but we also didn't get Dolby Vision. So this is kind of what you had to expect with this release is we just didn't get the works on it, but it's still pretty damn good. Now giving this an overall score is gonna be a little bit tough because I don't have that previous Blu-ray, but comparing everything in here, it's not the biggest jump to 4K I have ever seen. Now it is a 1990 film, but they did such a good job on their previous scans. If the previous scans look like the scan that's in that's on the disc three on here i still think that is a pretty damn good scan except for the scenes that they had to add from the original cut but when you just have the original when you just have the theatrical cut scenes that are in there those still those still look really good too i compared scenes in the police station and the hospital between all three scans and they're all pretty damn good i don't think it's a huge jump to 4k from blu-ray so it's going to be tough for me to say hey you know what this 4k is the greatest thing i've ever seen because yes, it looks great. This is the best The Exorcist 3 has ever looked. I can't imagine it looking better than this. You could tell Scream Factory has done the best they possibly could with all of these cuts. You know, they put all the effort in. They even make sure to let you know that they put all this effort in to try and bring you the best scan they possibly could. So this is more than likely the best that The Exorcist 3 is ever going to look. But if that's the case, what could I give this out of 10? Well, it's like I said, you know, if you have that previous Blu-ray, perhaps wait till October for the Shocktober sale because you know that's probably when you'll want to watch The Exorcist 3 anyway. It feels like the fall in this or at least you know late winter into spring so you know maybe wait till that Shocktober sale because I believe this is going for $27 right now and I don't regret my purchase because I do really enjoy this film and I hadn't owned it before but if you have that previous Blu-ray I'd say you could probably wait but I would say if you're a huge fan you can grab it now and you won't be disappointed. You know before we get out of here I didn't even get to show you guys the packaging on this because you do get a really nice slip cover which is like the original poster. Underneath you get the same artwork now it's not reversible cover art so you know that's kind of one thing it's very iffy with Scream and Shout Factory lately if we're gonna get that but they always seem to Splurge for the uh, individual disc design, which I will always, always, always appreciate. Like if you could just do that, that's just a little bit of extras that'll give you a little bit of extra points in my eyes because, you know, well, Paramount's the king of this where they just love to put the 4K on a black disc and they love to put the Blu-ray on a light blue disc. Really standard stuff and just to see Scream Factory take a little bit of an extra effort to put the disc design on those discs. Would I, pre would I have appreciated reversible cover art? Absolutely, but I'm just glad we got the slip cover because Matt got wanted on 4K from Shout Factory on Saturday and that did not have a slip cover. So it's really weird how Shout's doing this lately. Like everything just seems random. Are we gonna get slip cover, reversible cover art, but they never seem to skip out on that individual disc design, which I really do appreciate. So what would I give this out of 10? Like I've been really struggling on a final score with this. So I think I'm gonna still give it a really solid 8.5 out of 10. I can highly recommend this if you don't own this physically. If you have that previous Blu-ray, I'm going to say wait until there's a sale unless you're really desperate to see this film on 4K or rewatch it again because you're a huge fan. Then I can definitely recommend grabbing this, you know, maybe from Amazon. We actually have an Amazon affiliate link if you want to grab it through there. It's no extra cost to you and it really does help this channel out. But I really can recommend this film if you haven't seen it any which way you want to watch it, even if you don't want to watch it on 4K. I think that you should check out The Exorcist 3. Just make sure you never ever in your life watch The Exorcist 2. Pretend it doesn't exist just like this film does. But it's also Monday, and that means it's time to find out the winner of our digital code giveaway. And actually, it's two winners. Let me just be clear on that. And this week, we are going to spin the wheel two times, and whoever those two names it lands on, they are going to be your two lucky winners of this week's digital code giveaway and they're going to have their choice of the digital codes that you saw on your screen before you today. And if this happens to be your first digital code giveaway and you don't know how we do this and you just stumbled upon this at the end of this video, every single Friday, Matt or I will ask you two giveaway questions. You only have to answer one in the comment section below. Whenever you answered it, we would put your name on this magic wheel and then we spin that wheel 
today. And what questions did we ask you guys this week? Well, we asked you, what was your favorite Guillermo del Toro film? And what was your favorite film from 2000 to 2009? Guillermo del Toro films, most people picked Pan's Labyrinth, which is the choice that I would pick. Only one person picked Crimson Peak, and I was really hoping that somebody would pick that because I think that's a very underrated film in his filmography. I just feel like people expected a horror film with that one. And what they got was more of like a romance, but with beautiful set design. Like I said, production design, you could really rope me in with that. And Crimson Peak has some of the best so that wasn't a surprise as far as films from 2000 to 2009 i mean i don't know if we ever doubled up although i was very surprised actually let me uh, be clear there is a lot of fans of this channel who are huge fans of the early 2000s spider-man films starring toby mcguire and directed by sam raimi now matt loves those movies i'm a fan of but I actually have not revisited those since I saw Spider-Man 3 in theaters because I walked out of Spider-Man 3 extremely disappointed. I actually sat on the floor of that theater, me and Matt. I'm sure Matt doesn't remember because he can't remember anything. But I remember that the theater was sold out. We bought tickets to another movie and we sat on the floor to watch that because we were just huge Spider-Man fans. And I remember I was like, when he was dancing, I was like, is he fucking dancing? And I was like, and I, I don't know. I was one of those kids. I mean, I was like, I mean, I was a teenager, I guess, at the time or almost out of high school anyway. But it doesn't matter because I was just I was so disappointed with that film. And I haven't gone back since. And they really do deserve a rewatch because at the time, I remember I loved Spider-Man 1 and 2. I just, Spider-Man 3, you know, the end of a trilogy is just like the end of a film. You know, that's the lasting impression on you. And that one really did hurt me. But enough of me rambling, let's spin this magic wheel and see who this week's two winners are. All right, time for the first wheel spin. Wow, George T, that was close. All right, George, we're gonna remove your name. And we're gonna spin again. Congratulations, George T. And Ganesh Kumar. I believe that this is both of your first wins. George T. might have won one other time in the past, but I know he's been entering since the very, very beginning, so congratulations to both of you. Uh, Brian actually keeps stats, so we know who's won the previous giveaways. If people have won once or twice, two in a row, I don't know. I actually thought that was really cool. Uh, I think it was the last week of the week before he told us about who won in like a year ago. And I thought that was awesome. <laughs> he actually had all this stuff about who our previous winners are because honestly, once the giveaway is over and you guys claim your codes, I kind of delete everything from that week's giveaway to start preparing for the following week's giveaway. So it's really cool that Brian actually had all this stuff on hand because I have no idea unless I go back and watch the videos. But anyway, Ganesh, George T, congratulations to you guys. If you guys want to claim your digital codes, because I don't think you guys have won in the past, make sure you hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Direct message us, or you can always hit us up at our email address, let's talk ENTMT at gmail.com, and let us know which of the digital codes that you want. As long as the other winner didn't take that, that digital code is all yours and everyone who didn't win this week please come back to this friday's video we're going to do this all over again and if you do that we come back in a week from today and we do this all over again and anyway guys thank you so much for being a supporter of let's talk entertainment and media it really does mean the world to us we really appreciate it so much and if you want to keep helping us out nothing helps this channel out more than by you liking this video subscribing to the channel Search for us on all podcast services if you're in the podcast. Search for Let's Talk Entertainment and Media. Subscribe to us there. Give us a five-star rating. And then after you're done doing all of that, I want you to go to your local gym. Find anybody you want to. Tell them about Let's Talk Entertainment and Media. And there you're going to respond with, I don't know who the hell they are. And then you're going to sit down with them and explain it all to them. And anyway, guys, I'm just playing around. We'll be seeing you guys later. Have a good one. Yeah.